friends, welcome back to my kitchen. Welcome to another weekly meal prep. We have a really good week of meals today. I'm getting ready to shred up some parm because we're gonna do a really yummy, ooh, <laughs> a really yummy chicken carbonara for Monday. And if you're new around here, I like to prep out my weekday meals. And then on the weekend, we do a lot of grilling and cooking. My husband likes to cook a lot too. So usually we do Monday through Friday and I prep as much as I can just to help give myself a little leg up each night whenever it hits dinner time. This is a really, really simple pasta dish and it's packed full of flavor because it has bacon involved. <laughs> so I'm gonna pull out my frying pan in here and I'm actually going to get some bacon frying. We only need, I think, about four strips or so, and we're going to reserve some of the bacon grease to help out with our pasta sauce. All right, on this side of the stove over here, I'm going to get some water started for the pasta. We'll talk about the pasta in a second. I have the bacon ready to go on here. So I did start to heat the pan, and we always keep our cast irons oiled and the recipe does call for four slices. I had to double check that, but that's what it calls for. This is thick cut, and I almost always buy thick cut. I don't know, let me know in the comments if you like thick cut bacon too. I just feel like that's the best way to fry bacon, or I guess the best result with fried bacon. While our bacon is frying over here, the water is getting up to a boil. I'm gonna tell you about the spaghetti I'm gonna be using. Yes, I said spaghetti. Technically, I think carbonara is made with fettuccine, I wanna say, um, but we do eat a lot of gluten-free options. Not, we're not a totally gluten-free household, um, but my daughter and myself, we eat a majority of our diet gluten-free with a few exceptions here and there. Um, just for sensitivity reasons. And so I couldn't find gluten-free fettuccine and I could find spaghetti, which is the best next best thing if I'm saying the right pasta to begin with. Um, so that's what we're going to be making up in the water. I need to double check my size of this box with my recipe just to make sure I don't need to use a little bit less because of, of it being a different shape pasta. So we're going to fry up the bacon until it is kind of medium crispy, not over crispy, but nice enough to cut up. And um, we're going to then work on frying the chicken. So I need to get the chicken out and cut that into strips. I wanna say a big thank you to Factor for sponsoring this week's video. We have loved Factor for quite a few years and it really is a lifesaver, particularly in busy seasons of life. Factor makes meeting your nutritional goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. Their team of gourmet chefs create each meal using only ingredients with integrity to help you feel your best all day long. You all know how much I love to meal prep, but sometimes life throws you curveballs and I'm not always able to accomplish that. So Factor takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success. You can skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue, which happens to even me, guys. <laughs> Instead, get chef-crafted meals, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and much more. Besides their fantastic meals, Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, small bites, and more to keep me going no matter what's on the schedule. So you can head to factor75.com or you can use the link in the description box below and use my code Adeline50 to get 50% off your first box. And then you're also going to get 20% off of your next month of orders. So like I said, head to factor75.com, use my code, add a line 50 to get 50% off your first box. And then you will also get 20% off of your next month's order. I don't often make pasta dishes. It's once in a while. I would say not even on a weekly basis do we eat pasta. Um, but if you're running low on protein or you have only two chicken breasts and you're trying to feed the whole family, a good pasta dish is very filling and makes your protein stretch further for sure. So 
I am going to use two chicken breasts. I believe the recipe calls for half a pound of chicken, which to me seems like not quite enough protein for our entire family. So I am just going to cut these down into strips and I'm just gonna make sure there's enough for everybody in the family. And my box of pasta is 12 ounces, which is the right size for this recipe. So I'm glad that I can use it all up. I hate whenever I have just a little bit of pasta left from a box or a recipe and I don't really know what to do with it other than maybe make it for lunch as a side or something. So I'm glad that I can use the whole thing up. Love to hear if you guys have started school where you live, if your kids have started school where you live. We have started our school year, we do homeschool, and so that brings another dynamic to our schedules during the week and just making sure we get everything fit in. But it's really fun because this year we're first, second, and third grade, and so the girls have, ah, they're just at such great ages. They're at an age where everybody wants to learn and they're enjoying history and science and just enjoying learning together. Sorry if it's a little over bright. The afternoon sun is just coming in, it's streaming in. All right, so I'm pulling the bacon off now and you can kind of gauge how much grease, you know, you need in your pan. If it feels like it's a lot or good excess, you can drain some of it off. I don't mind what I have in here, particularly because this is a cast iron pan. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and put this chicken in here and I am using a bit more chicken than the original recipe recommended. So I'm doing that. I'm also checking on my water, which is almost to a boil. That's one thing with the Dutch oven like that where you can't see through the lid. You have to check the water to see if it's boiling. So we're gonna have a nice sizzle here. I'm gonna reduce the temperature just a little bit so that this doesn't burn before the chicken is cooked through. It's gonna get really loud. <laughs> but I'm also going to wait until the chicken is almost cooked and then add in some minced garlic. Um, she, in the recipe, recommends doing it a bit earlier, but I'm afraid we're gonna end up with some burnt garlic at this point. So I'm just going to start in on the chicken. I also need to salt and pepper the chicken as well. We're gonna get some good crispy chicken, I think, with this grease in the pan. My timer is about to go off for the pasta. We're gonna reserve a little bit of the pasta water, but I did get out some of my frozen garlic cubes now that the chicken is almost cooked. We're gonna put a few of those in to this combination to make the sauce. So we're kind of starting the sauce in the midst of the chicken. <laughs> All right, so one of the keys to 
this recipe being successful is low heat when it comes to making this part of the sauce. So I've got some eggs here and we're going to take four of them and crack them into this bowl and we are going to whisk them with some parsley and the parm that I already shredded up whenever we first started this cooking adventure today. <laughs> and basically the eggs are going to very slowly cook on the pasta. But if it's really, really hot, you're gonna end up with scrambled eggs in your pasta and that's not what we're going for here. So what I find helps me out with a recipe like this is some good kitchen shears like this one because I'm able to cut up my parsley and I'm gonna be able to cut my bacon with that as well without having to get out the cutting board for this part of the recipe. So I am going to use about a third cup of parsley and my family enjoys parsley, just not big chunks of it in whatever we're eating. So I'm going to make sure that it's all cut fairly small and we're going to um, pour this right over the chicken and the pasta. I'm gonna put the pasta in. Now, because I reserved, I think it's over there, some of the pasta water, we can use that to help thin out the sauce if we need to a little bit as we go. And I did pull that off because it got kind of hot from frying the chicken and I wanted it just to cool down a bit. So I turned down my heat and pulled it off for just a little bit just to see um, if I could get it to calm down a bit. <laughs> Matting in the Parmesan. And again, just going to kind of give everything a good whisk to make sure that the Parm is coated well with the eggs. And that way it all gets put in together. Okay, so now I'm going to take the pasta we're gonna dump that right into the pan with the leftover bacon grease and the chicken and the garlic. I did put the garlic in there and um, just let it kind of cook up a bit. So now I'm going to pour the egg mixture over the entire pan full of everything. And while it's still hot and this is still not quite hot, I'm gonna grab something. All right, so we wanna coat the pasta with the egg. And as it slowly cooks, it's just going to make this nice creamy sauce on the pasta. Oh, I'm so excited to eat this. It looks so delicious. And then we're gonna get to actually um, doing the bacon as well. So this is gonna be a very pretty dish along with tasting just divine. You really do wanna keep stirring though because you don't want the egg to sit on the bottom of the pan and make scrambled eggs. <laughs> you want it to be mixed with the liquid and with the parm. Here's a bit of that pasta water that I reserved. I'm just using a little bit at a time. Okay, so while this heats up, I'm going to cut up the bacon. We'll give it that yummy look with the bacon bits in it, the, the signature look from Carbonara. All right, so it's kind of rainy and overcast, so I turned on 
the overhead lights if you see the lighting changing a little bit here so we are going to change gears now on monday along with that carbonara i'm going to be stir frying some zucchini and summer squash we have a lot of that coming out of our patio garden right now so it's going to work out great to be able to do that as a side along with the delicious pasta but we're going to switch now to tuesday which kind of works with the rainy weather since we are going to do some soup and I am putting this on. You can call me a wimp, I don't care. I've had my hands really burnt before from cutting up jalapenos. <laughs> so I like to wear a glove um, when I can and for the hand that I'm touching the jalapenos with. So I'm actually going to make a jalapeno popper soup. It's going to be so delicious. I have some home canned stuff over here that's gonna go into it, some home canned shredded chicken, chicken broth and tomatoes. And then we also have some salsa. And I actually thought I was totally out of salsa. And whenever I was organizing my cellar area last week, if you guys missed that video, you can definitely check that out. But I found one last jar, it's been sitting in my refrigerator actually, of salsa. So we're gonna use that in the soup and enjoy that last jar of salsa from last year. And I need to do some this year. I'm not sure if it's gonna happen yet this summer. We have a lot going on. Either way, we're going to enjoy it in the soup. So I'm just going to cut up some jalapeno. I'm gonna start my little Dutch oven back here to build this soup into. I'm hoping it all fits in here. I'm actually working on boiling some water up because my family's gonna eat some corn on the cob, so that's not really a part of this prep, but that's what this kettle is back here for. for. And you can cut the jalapenos however you like. I think I am going to cut these not into rings, but a little bit smaller, a little more like diced. And if you don't want them quite as spicy, um, you don't have to keep the seeds in the inside. So this is the part of the jalapeno that actually has a lot of the heat in it, is the seeds and the inside core portion of the jalapeno. So I may leave at least one of these with the seeds inside, we'll see, just to keep a little bit of kick there, but not too overpowering, especially for my daughters. And then this is going to also get some cream cheese put into it, so it will help to cool it down a little bit as well but they can always add a little sour cream if it's still too hot for them. So I'm going to put some olive oil into the bottom of my Dutch oven, and I'm going to be putting all these veggies in the olive oil to sort of saute them um, and soften them up before we start building the rest of the soup. So we're going to be putting the jalapenos in here. We're gonna be doing some red bell pepper, one of my favorite things to cook with. And then we're also going to be dicing up an onion as well. The veggies are cooked up, they're getting kind of soft, the uh, onions are turning more translucent. So I'm gonna actually scoop all of this out and if you miss a few pieces in the bottom, it's not really a big deal. I have two bags of frozen cauliflower florets that I actually thawed out. You do not need to thaw them out for this part. They just happened to land in my refrigerator when we got home from getting groceries last and so that's where they've been sitting. Um, but I'm going to scoop these out. We're gonna put four cups of, or a quart 
of chicken broth in here with the cauliflower. And we're just going to cook it up until the cauliflower is cooked. And then we are going to put it in the blender. So you're not actually gonna have cauliflower pieces in this soup. It's going to be blended and help to kind of bring a creaminess to the soup base while still hiding some more veggies in the soup without realizing that you're eating cauliflower. And these are, I think, 12 to 16 ounce bags. You know what, I think it, the recipe may call for more like 16 ounces. I might have a third bag that I picked up in the refrigerator. I need to look here. Cauliflower is such an easy, sneaky ingredient <laughs> to use in creamy soups because you can blend it right up and you'll never know that it's in the soup. Okay, so it's been a little bit. Our cauliflower is softened. I just put a fork through it just to test it out. And I'm going to take a slotted spoon and I'm going to scoop all of the cauliflower. It's not my slotted spoon. <laughs> I'm gonna scoop all of the cauliflower into my blender to be able to blend it into the base of the soup. And one thing I caution you on is when you're gonna blend a hot soup, you wanna be very careful to not put a completely sealed lid on the blender because you can create a lot of pressure inside the blender. So you wanna be able to either crack open the lid a little bit or like mine, I actually have a opening in the top where I can take the opening out and I'm able to just blend it with that opening. So I'm gonna do that. I'm just straining out the rest of this and then I'm gonna pour it in here so that we can blend it in with the broth. Good old dishcloth that's seen better days. <laughs> this on here, we're gonna turn this down. It's only gonna take a minute to do this. To the hot cauliflower mixture, we're gonna add eight ounces of cream cheese and obviously it's going to melt right into this because it's so hot with the broth and the cauliflower coming right off of the stove. But this is just going to give a really creamy, yummy base to this soup. Okay, we're gonna put our creamy base back in to our pot. We're going to put back in the cooked veggies along with those jalapenos. Now we're gonna add in around two cups of chicken. You could have diced, um, grilled chicken, I'm using my home canned chicken and I'm just going to also add the chicken broth that was in this right with it. Now I'm going to add a jar of salsa and I'm going to add two jars of tomatoes and I'm just going to leave the broth or the tomato juice in with them. And this is where I wasn't sure if we were gonna fit. I think we're going to just sew fit into this pot. <laughs> Very close for sure. I'm gonna give everything a nice stir. And doesn't that just look fantastic? So creamy. So we're gonna allow this to cook. I'm gonna add a couple more spices here. To this mixture, I'm gonna add, I drained these black beans. We're gonna add about a cup of black beans. So a little over half of this can. We're going to add in some salt and some smoked paprika. 
We're gonna let everything just kind of simmer together so that the flavors begin to combine. This smells so good. I am so excited to eat this. And I think I may even have enough leftover to put a portion in the freezer this week um, to save for another meal at some point. We're moving on to Wednesday and Wednesday we're going to do some meatloaf, mashed potatoes and green beans. Now the green beans will be kind of like a garlic green bean that I'll stir fry on the night that we eat them. But we are gonna prep the mashed potatoes and the meatloaf. Meatloaf is something I really like prepping because it takes a little over an hour to bake meatloaf and it's really easy to reheat in the air fryer. So the prep for meatloaf is a long one. So we're gonna get this popped into the oven. We're gonna get potatoes boiling to make our mashed potatoes and then we will start on Thursday's meal because it's just gonna simply take a while for this to bake. So in the bowl over here, I have about two pounds of ground beef. So this is going to be a beef meatloaf and I'm taking a small onion and I'm gonna be dicing that up Personally, I think that's what gives meatloaf its signature flavor is having onion in it, kind of is the flavor of most meatloafs. And then of course, I'm going to make sort of a barbecue sauce to go on top of it, more of like a homemade barbecue sauce my mom used to make with like ketchup and mustard, a little brown sugar, just kind of whisk that all together. But first we're going to be putting all of the components into the meatloaf. So I'm going to dice up the onion. I have an egg here, and then I also have a cup of milk. Um, and I try to use regular milk. This is actually a combination of almond milk and then some heavy cream, because you do want that fat in there. It just really helps it out. And then we eat a lot of gluten-free options, options, alternatives, I guess, in our household. And one of them we really love is this uh, I wanna say Aleas is the brand name. I actually don't think I've ever even read the brand name. I just know what the container looks like and I always grab it. But this makes the best meatloaf, great texture. I've tried a lot of gluten-free breadcrumbs and my family has informed me when they do not care for one or <laughs> what I'm trying to do. So I've tried doing gluten-free crackers crushed up and just for some reason, this brand is the one that always is the winner. I do find it at giant food stores. It's the only place I've been able to find it this far. I need to really look it up so I can find out where their retailers are. So then maybe I can find it in a few other places. So I do try to chop the onion pretty small to go into this. And um, if not, you got kind of big pieces that are uncomfortable to bite into. So. I'm gonna throw these all in here. Oh, the onion. I know, you guys. There's like four or five different things I could be doing right now to help this out, but I'm just trying to hurry up and get it chopped up. You all have given me so many ideas that do actually work on helping with the onion tears. <laughs> I'm gonna take my rings off. They don't like putting them into this mixture and then I have a small, I would say on the smaller size loaf pan here and that's what I'm going to be pressing my meatloaf into. Now I do kind of round the top. I feel like I have a tear that's gonna be rolling out really soon. <laughs> um, I do kind of round the top and sort of shape it so that at the end we've got more of a rounded looking loaf and also if there's any extra fats, they can go around the edge of the loaf instead of sinking into the middle if it would be like dipped in or anything in the middle of the loaf. So I'm just going to mix this together by hand, making sure that the onions are very well combined into the meat mixture. I did spray my pan and the oven is set at 350. And I think you can't rush doing meatloaf either. It really just has to have its time in the oven, like I said. Okay, so now I'm just gonna show you the shape I was talking about. Just sort of evenly putting it all in, but sort of shaping the top of it like a loaf of bread. I'll even take my fingers and sort of press them in around the edges just a bit to help any excess. Um, fat that we might need to kind of drain off of the loaf. 
There, that looks perfect. I'm gonna rinse my hands and pop this in the oven. Since I'm using red potatoes for the mashed potatoes, I could technically leave the skin on, um, but my family for the most part prefers whenever I peel the potatoes. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I use red potatoes most of the time. Once in a while, I'll grab some regular baking potatoes, but the red potatoes have a little less starch in them than all the other white or yellow potatoes. So since I know that, I try to get these. It just makes for a little bit of a nicer um, texture when it comes to mashed potatoes. And one of the reasons I know that, that they have less starch is because they are the best potatoes for home canned potatoes. And I believe I've shown that in the past of how to do that. Um, I will get really big bags of potatoes from local markets and I will can them up in jars and we use them for fried potatoes. They do not make very nice mashed potatoes. You can't really mash canned potatoes because they get kind of grainy is I think the right word. Um, but they work great for a lot of other things, potatoes and soup and just pretty much anything else. I've even make, made scalp potatoes before with, oh, my oven's coming to temp, um, with the canned potatoes. There's a lot you can do with them. You just can't mash them or you could, but they just don't come out great. <laughs> so since I am familiar with how they respond in a canning setting, that's why I tend to use them for cooking as well. So for example, if you were to can a regular like baking potato, um, the ones that look a little bit longer, you see them a lot in restaurants and other things for baking, um, it, they would get very starchy, the water would get very starchy and they would get very mushy um, in your jar. So that is why I use red potatoes for that purpose and why I tend to cook with them more. Okay, I drained the water off of the potatoes. They are like fork tender. I have no idea if that's a term or not, but I'm using it. <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and put some butter in with the potatoes. I don't really measure this because I don't always have the same amount of potatoes. So I kind of eyeball it. I know about how much butter I wanna put in with my potatoes. Same with the sour cream and my seasoning. I'll show you that here in a minute. We were using this to make tacos, so there's a little bit of taco seasoning in the sour cream. <laughs> so I just kind of have about a ballpark of what I usually put in. My ratio, I guess, would be a good way to say it. So I'm gonna put that in. And then I like to use, surprise, surprise, the buttery steakhouse seasoning. You all know how much I love getting that from Costco. So I put a little sprinkle of that across everything. And I just hand mash. I know everybody has different ways. They like to mash potatoes and I'll grab milk if I need to, depending on how much water the potatoes have absorbed, how long I've cooked them, um, just to help thin it out just a bit. But honestly, I feel like a good potato masher gets a nice consistency going because you don't want them to be too runny. You know, you want a little bit of a bulky texture to mash potatoes. And so I have used an immersion blender before, but I feel like that gets it a little too runny. And if I get out my stand mixer, it's just another thing that gets messy, whereas this potato masher I can just throw right into the dishwasher. Doesn't take up much room. And we're not making a second pot dirty. So I just usually stir it around like that. And if you're wanting a good stainless masher, I can link this one below on Amazon. Now to store this, I'll just put this in to a container and then whenever we go to heat this up, I will just put it into a pot on the stove. If I have to add a little extra milk to it just to kind of get it to the right consistency in the reheating process, I'll do that. But it still takes way less time than peeling, cutting, boiling potatoes. <laughs> so that's one reason I like to prep this ahead of time. Really love this consistency I've got here, so I don't think I'm gonna add any milk to it. Um, at least not now. Like I said, I may in the reheat process. 
The meatloaf is still baking in the oven. And we're gonna go ahead and get started on Thursday's meal. Now, this meal is going to be another soup. Guys, I am just squeaking my foot into the great fall soups with fall just edging its way closer and closer to us. So you're gonna get some good inspo for those cooler months coming up. So we got two pounds of ground beef. We are going to do a great vegetable, beef vegetable soup. My mom used to make this all the time and we are just gonna do a very simple version. We're going to put some carrots, celery, green beans, and onion into it along with a few other things. And I have some great home canned beef bone broth that is very good for your tummy. It's just such a great time to be rebooting your immune system as the colder months come in and flu season comes around. So making good broth-based soups is a great way to amp up your body for those times. So we're going to brown the beef um, while we chop up some of these veggies. I do have some pre-chopped celery that I get from Azure Standard here. And then I have some home canned green beans. So those things will fry up very easily. So the thing that we're going to need to fry probably the longest is the carrots and the onions. I did peel these off camera um, while I was waiting for the potatoes to boil for the mashed potatoes. So we're gonna just chop these up into great bite-sized pieces and then we will get them thrown in with the meat once it browns a little bit. All right, so the beef is browned and we are just gonna go ahead and dump the frozen celery, the chopped onion, and the chopped carrot in here. And we're going to just give it a nice little stir and then I'm gonna put the lid back on this and let the carrots get soft. So we're just gonna let this cook until the carrots are softer. Um, and putting the lid on is gonna help that process go by a little faster. Our meatloaf is out of the oven. We're gonna mix up that sauce for on top here in just a second, but I do wanna get the rest of the ingredients put in to the beef vegetable soup so that they can combine and simmer just a little bit. So we have a jar of diced tomatoes. We're gonna dump in along with the broth or juices from the tomatoes with our cooked carrots and other veggies that are now soft and tender. We're gonna put in a quart of beef broth. And I think the recipe actually calls for six cups, but I want this to be a bit more condensed than um, what it calls for. I'm also putting in a quart of canned green beans, or I'm trying to. <laughs> um, I may end up taking my spatula here and going through and really chopping them up because they're a little on the long side but we're going to put some Worcestershire sauce <laughs> if you know you know into this as well it just brings out the flavor of the beef really well we're going to add some pepper and some salt into this as well and you can go ahead and put garlic powder and onion powder i'm not going to just simply because i actually did throw a few cubes of my minced garlic that I keep in the freezer into the meat. I forgot to mention that. Um, and then we also have onions in it. So I feel like it's got a good flavor profile in there um, with all the veggies. And you could also put some chili powder in here as well. Personally, I like that in chili and in more like Mexican inspired dishes. I don't care for it as much in the vegetable soup. So I'm going to just leave that out, but we're gonna let this entire thing simmer and we'll mix up our sauce. All right, so I just mix this up to taste and just use some ketchup, some mustard, and brown sugar, like I said. But while I'm doing this, I wanted to tell you all about how to reheat this every single time I do a meal prep. There's at least one, if not quite a few comments about reheating questions. So I'm trying my best to remember to chat with you about that. One of the best things you can invest in for reheating freezer meals and meal preps is an air fryer. I have a couple of them actually, <laughs> and really, really like the job they do to heating things up. So what I'm going to do is actually let this meatloaf cool completely, totally cool with the uh, sauce on top of it. 
Once it's fully cool, in fact, I may let it sit in the refrigerator for a little while in low form inside the pan because I want to be able to slice it. Um, and then I'm going to store it sliced in a container. And then we will reheat the slices of meatloaf in the air fryer. It'll just heat it up really nicely. It's not going to dry it out too much or allow it to get too moist either. Sometimes meatloaf can fall apart um, in trying to reheat it the second time. So this is going to help everything keep its shape and stay very, very nice. I'm gonna taste this. I think it needs just a hair more brown sugar. I just kind of taste and go until it tastes like what my mom's sauce used to taste like. <laughs> um, but it is the flavor that for me goes right with meatloaf is this combination. It's not meatloaf if it doesn't have this on it. And sometimes I even mix up extra um, when we're going to eat this just to pour over it. My husband really enjoys that. So that is my reheat process for this. You could definitely reheat it in the microwave um, or even on a frying pan, like on a skillet. You could put a little bit of oil in a skillet and um, reheat it that way as well. But I prefer to reheat it in the air fryer. Um, and my air fryer actually that I use the most has a reheat setting. This is making a huge mess. <laughs> um, and so I can just hit that reheat button and it does a really, really fantastic job. I'm gonna have to wash this pot holder. Oh my goodness, I am really making a mess. This is another reason that I like to make that little um, edge, the little trough around the edge is it helps to catch the extra sauce whenever I put the sauce on top like this. We have finally made it to Friday and we're making something that I've honestly been craving so much the last week or so. I decided it has to be made this week and that is a cowboy turkey skillet meal. We're gonna use some ground turkey, that's what I'm getting out here. And I had made this, I believe, in a what I eat in a day or a day of meals style video a couple of weeks ago and um, we just so enjoy this. It's such a great meal for leftovers. It makes a nice amount and you're getting a lot of healthy ingredients. You got beans going into it and some other stuff. And we like to top it with some sour cream. We're also going to be putting some brown rice into it as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and get that started over here in my saucepan while I am browning up the ground turkey. I'm just going to be using the organic brown rice that I like to get from Costco. You could also use like a parboil rice in this, um, but this is what I have on hand up here in my kitchen um, and I want to get it used up. So I'm doing about a cup and a half dry rice and then we're gonna go ahead and add some chicken broth to this as well. All right, so while the meat was browning and the rice was cooking, I went ahead and chopped up about three bell peppers and about one and a half onions. And we are going to go ahead and add that right in with the turkey and that's going to steam up. We've been sauteing a lot of veggies today, which is great. That means we're gonna get a lot in our diet this week. And I've said this before, but I think with prepping things or really getting your week prepared, you have a good idea of what nutrition you are putting in to your diet and your family's diet. So to go along with this, we're gonna do some salt and pepper, and I have some cumin and smoked paprika as well. And we are going to add the rice in once it's done cooking. And then I also have a can of pinto beans here and a two jars of diced tomatoes and I'm going to drain those before I put them in and I'm also going to rinse the beans as well. So this is a little more like a stir fry. It's kind of, that's why I'm calling it a skillet meal. Um, it's not a soup. It doesn't have a whole lot of broth to it, which to me is why it works out so well to top it off with a little bit of sour cream. It's just delicious in my opinion and adds such a good 
Southwest topping to this Southwest inspired meal. We're also going to add in some frozen yellow corn. I've done this exact recipe with my home canned creamed corn and I just like the texture a little bit better of the frozen corn kernels and I don't generally freeze a lot of corn. I do a lot of um, an Amish method of canning corn in the creamed corn method. Um, so I did pick this up at the store. So I'm gonna go ahead and drain the beans and put this stuff in. adding into this is the pinto beans. I just don't like to put them in too soon because they're already cooked and I don't want them to get too mushy. I still like them to have a little bit of body. So I'm gonna stir this all together. It barely fits in my largest um, cast iron frying pan, <laughs> but it squeezes in. Sometimes I lose a few pieces of pepper or other ingredients over the side but this is so delicious. If you like beans and rice and those sorts of dishes, you will really enjoy this. If you all enjoyed this prep, then you might wanna check out last week's prep here. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe, chat with me in the comments. I love to hear from you all. Give this video a like, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.